Welcome to Shahnameh, May, Book of Kings. Today we continue with the reign of Secondor. Secondor summoned the Indian physician who could diagnose a man's health from a drop of urine. He questioned him as to the cause of illness that makes one weep with pain, and the physician answered, Whoever overeats and does not watch what he consumes during meals will grow ill. A healthy person will not eat too much, and a great man is one who seeks to be healthy. Now I will prepare an ointment for you from herbs gathered in various places, and by using this you will stay in good health. Your appetite will increase, but if you overeat, there will be no harmful results. If you do as I instruct you, your blood and marrow will grow strong, and your body will flush with health, and you will be eager to do noble deeds, and your hair will not turn white. White hair makes one despair of the world. Secondor said, I have never heard of such a thing, or observed it in any sovereign. If you can bring me this ointment, you will be my guide through this world. My soul will be at your service, and your enemies will be unable to harm you. He had a robe of honor and other fine gifts prepared for the physician, and made him chief of all his doctors. The eloquent physician then made his way into the mountains with a few of his own companions. His knowledge of plants was extensive, and he knew both poisons and their antidotes. He gathered a great many mountain herbs, throwing away the useless ones and choosing those that were beneficial. These he used to prepare the ointment he rubbed Secondor's body with this concoction, and for years the king's body remained healthy. Then the king began to devote his nights to carousing rather than to sleep. His mind was filled with desire for women, and he sought out soft, enticing places to be with them. This way of life weakened the king, but he gave no thought to the harm he was doing to his body. One day the physician noted signs of weakness in the king's urine and said to him, There's no doubt that a young man grows old quickly by sleeping with women. It looks to me as though you haven't slept properly for three nights. Tell me, am I right? And Secondor answered, I am perfectly well. My body has no trace of weakness in it. But the Indian doctor did not agree with him. And that night he searched his books and prepared a remedy against body infirmities. That same night a Secondor slept alone, unaccompanied by any of his beautiful womenfolk. At sunrise the doctor came to examine in his urine, and he found that there was no tell-tale signs of of uh, anything at this time, so he threw away the remedy he'd mixed and ordered wine, a feast, and musicians. The king asked him, Why do you throw away the medicine you'd taken such time to prepare? He replied, Last night. The king of the world gave no thought to find a companion. He slept through the night alone in the darkness, and since you slept alone, my lord, you need no medicine. Secondor laughed, pleased to be free of the threat of illness, and said, May the world never be without India. All the astronomers and great savants of the world seemed to live there. Giving the doctor a purse of gold and a black horse with golden bells attached to the bridle, Secondor said to him, May wisdom always guide your noble soul. Next, he gave orders that the golden goblet be filled with cold water and brought to him. Then everyone drank from the goblet from dawn to dusk, but the water did not decrease. The king said to the wisest philosopher of his time, You mustn't conceal from me what's happening here. How is it that the water in this cup is always replenished? Is it something to do with the stars, or is it the skill of the Indians possess? The philosopher replied, Your Majesty. This goblet is not some thing to make light of. It took the makers many years and a great deal of toil to fashion this. Astrologers from every country gathered at Cade's court to produce this cup and worked on it through bright days and dark nights, consulting their tables for days on end. Thinking of what happens here is as analogous to magnetism, which attracts iron. In a similar way, this cup attracts moisture from the turning heavens. But it does so in such a subtle fashion that the human eyes cannot see the process. Secondor was delighted with the answer, and he said to the elders of Malad, I shall never break my treaty with Cade. He is a man whom one must respect, and he has given me these four wonders. I shall demand nothing further from him. 
Thus, Seconder gathered together two hundred camel loads of precious goods, to which he added a hundred jeweled crowns as well as uncut jewels and gold coins, and had all this hidden in the mountains. Once all this wealth had been concealed, the men we've done the deed were never seen again. Only the massive treasure sovereign lord knew where the mountain hid this glittering hoard. Having hidden his treasure in this way, Secondar led his army out from Malad and bore down on Connage like the wind. He wrote a threatening bellicose letter from Secondar, the son of Philquis, who lights the flame of prosperity and adversity, to Four, the Lord of India, favored by heavens, commander of the armies of Sindh. The letter opened with praise of God, the Creator, who is eternal, saying that those to whom he gives victory never want for countries, crowns, and thrones, while those from whom he turns away become wretched, and the sun never shines on them. You will have heard how God has given me far, victory, good fortune, crowns, thrones, and sovereignty over this dark earth. But none of this will last, and my days draw on. Another will come after me to enjoy my conquests. My only ambition is to leave a good name and no disgrace behind me on this sublunar earth. When they bring this letter to you, free your dark soul from sorrow. Descend from your throne. Do not consult with your priests or advisers, but mount your horse and come to me asking for my protection. Those who try to trick me only prolong matters, and if for one moment you disobey me by choosing arrogance and warfare, I shall descend on your country like a fire, bringing an army of picked warriors, and once you see my cavalry, you will regret your delay in submitting to me. The letter was sealed with Seconder's mark, and a soldier who was eager for fame was chosen to take it. The messenger arrived at the court. When Four was told of his arrival, he was summoned into the royal presence. When Four read Seconder's letter, he started up in rage and immediately wrote a furious reply, planting a tree in the Garden of Vengeance. We should fear God and not use such presumptuous language because a boastful man will find himself friendless and with no resources. Have you no shame that you summon me like this? Isn't your wisdom disturbed by this kind of talk? If it were Philoquus, writing thus to four, that would be something. But you? You dare to stir up trouble in this way? Your victory over Dara has gone to your head. But the heavens have had enough of it. And fate deals in this way with people who won't listen to good advice. And you found your quarrel with Cade was like a feast, so now you think all kings are your prey to hunt down? The ancient kings of Iran never addressed us in this way. I am Four, descended from the family of Four, and we have never paid any attention to Caesars from the West. When Dara asked for my help, I sent him war elephants to buy time, although I saw that neither his heart nor his fortune were as they should be. When he was murdered by a slave, good fortune deserted the Persians. If evil came to him from an evil counselor, is that any reason for you to lose your good sense? Don't be so eager for battle and so, dis so disrespectful toward me. Soon enough, you'll see my war elephants and armies crowding the way before you. All you think of is your own glory, but inside you are the color of Aramon. Don't sow these seeds of strife throughout the world. Fear, misfortune, and the harm that you have done will come to you. I mean well by this letter, and may it gratify your heart. After reading this letter, Seconder immediately selected chieftains from his army, men who were worthy of command, old in their understanding, but young in years. Then he led his men against four, and they were so numerous that the earth was like a heaving sea. They traveled by every pathway, so that there seemed to be no track that they didn't take, over mountains, along seashores, and through the most difficult terrain. The army grew weary of harsh traveling and fierce battles, and one evening, when they pitched camp, a group of them came before the king, and they said, Sovereign of Greece, and of all Asia too, earth cannot hold the massive armies you lead out against the world. Four will not fight, and China's emperor quails before your might. 
Why should your army's valiant soldiers die for worthless lands beneath an alien sky? In all our ranks, we cannot find one horse that's fit for war. And if we reverse our course, the infantry and cavalry will stray by unfamiliar paths and they'll lose their way. Before, we fought and gained our victories against the strength of human enemies. But none of us desires to die in war. With mountains and the seas and fertile shores, men do not fight with rocks and ocean tides, with barren plains and ragged mountainsides. Do not convert the glory of our fame to ignominious and ignoble shame. Seconder was angered by their words, and he made short work of their complaints. He said, In war with the Persians, no Greek soldier was injured. Dara was killed by his own slaves, and none of you suffered. I shall continue on my way without you, and place my foot on the dragon's heart alone. You will see that the wretched four will have no desire for either battle or banquets when I have dealt with him. My help comes from God and the Persian army, and I have no need of Greek goodwill. Frightened by his anger, the army begged him to pardon them and said, We are all Caesar's slaves, and we tread the earth only as wills us to. We shall go on, and when there are no horses left, we shall fight on foot. If the earth becomes a sea with our blood, and the low places become hills of corpses, even if the heaven rains down mountainous rocks, no enemy will ever see our backs in battle. We are your slaves, here for you to command, and how could you suffer any injury from us? Secondor then formed a new battle plan. He chose 30,000 Persian warriors headed by experienced, well-armored chieftains. Behind them he placed 40,000 Greek cavalry, and behind them his warlike Egyptian cavalry, who fought with swords. 40,000 of Dara's troops and the men from Persian royal family accompanied them. Secondor picked out 12,000 Greek and Egyptian cavalry to bring up the rear and scour the plains and valleys. With his army, Secondor had 60 astrologers and sages to advise him on the most suspicious days for combat. When Four became aware of the enemy's approach, he chose a place subtle and suitable for battle, and his troops crowded the plains for four miles with elephants in the van and his warriors behind them. Meanwhile, Secondor's spies told him of the war elephants in Four's army, and how with their overpowering trunks that they were under the protection of Saturn, they could destroy two miles of cavalry who would be unable either to defeat them or to get back to their own ranks. The spies drew a picture of an elephant on a piece of paper and showed it to the king, who had a model of the animal made from wax. Then he turned to his advisors and said, Who can think of some way to defeat this? The wise men of the court pondered the problem and then gathered together from Greece, Egypt, and Persia, a group of more than 40 times 30 blacksmiths, all of whom were expert at their trade. They made a horse of iron with an iron saddle and an iron rider. Its joints were held together with nails and solder, and then they polished both the rider and its steed. It was mounted on wheels and filled with black oil. They pushed it in front of Secondar, who was pleased by the device and saw that it would be very useful. He ordered more than a thousand of these iron horses and riders be made. What the king had ever seen an army of dappled gray bay and black horses, all of them made of iron. The devices went forward on wheels and looked exactly like cavalry prepared for war. As Secondor approached Four's forces, the two armies caught sight of each other, and amid clouds of dust a great cry went up from each side, and the warriors advanced on each other eager for battle. Then Secondar's men set fire to oil in the iron horses and routed Four's forces. Flames flared out from the iron steeds, and as soon as the elephants saw this, they plunged precipitately the way and that way and this way and that way, and Four's armies were in turmoil. And when the elephants wrapped their trunks around the burning horses, they were maddened by their wounds, and their mayhouts were bewildered as to what to do. The whole Indian army, including its mighty elephants, began to flee, and Secondor pursued his malicious enemies like the wind. As the air darkened at nightfall, there was nowhere left for the army to fight. 
seconder, and the Greek halted at a place between two mountains and set out scouts to keep their camp safe from the enemy. When the sun rose like a gold ingot, making the world as bright as clear crystal, the din of trumpets, bugles, and fifes rang out, and the two armies, thrusting their lances into the heavens, prepared to fight again. Clutching his Greek sword, Seconder came between the hosts and sent a horseman to shout from a distance to four. Seconder stands before his troops and seeks to talk with four and hear the words he speaks. When four heard this, he hurried to the head of his troops. Seconder said, Two armies have been shattered on these plains, where feral scavengers eat human brains. And horses tread on bones, we're brave and young, each of us a noble champion. Our warriors have been killed, or they have fled. Why should they flee or be left here for dead? Why should two countries fight when combat can decide who is the victor, man to man? Prepare to face me. One of us alone will live to claim these armies and this throne. Four agreed to this proposal, thinking that his own body was like a lion's and that his horse was the equal of any fierce dragon, while Seconder was as thin as a reed, wore light armor, and rode an exhausted mount. He said, This is a noble custom, hand to hand. We will decide who's ruler of this land. Grasping their swords, they advanced on one another in the space between the two hosts. When Seconder saw his massive opponent, his fearsome sword in hand and mounted on a huge horse, he was astonished and almost despaired of his life. Nevertheless, he went forward, and as he did, so did four, with distracted by a cry that went up from the rear of his army and turned toward it. Like the wind, then, Seconder bore down on him and struck the lion-like warrior with a mighty sword blow. The blade sliced through Four's neck and trunk, and he fell from his horse to the earth. The Greek commander was overjoyed, and his warriors rushed forward. The earth and clouds re-echoed with a thunder of lion-skin drum and the blare of trumpets. The Indian warriors looked on Seconder with fury and were ready to fight, but a voice rang out from the Greek ranks. Four's head lies here in the dust. His mammoth body is hacked and torn. Who is it you wish to fight for? Who will benefit from more sword blows and destructions? Secondor has become to you as Four was. It is he you must look to now for battles and banquets. With a roar, the Indian warriors called out their agreement, and they went forward to gaze at Four's hacked and bloody body. A wail of sorrow went up from their ranks, and they threw down their weapons. Fearfully, they went before Seconder, groaning and heaping dust on their head. But Seconder returned their weapons, and his words were welcoming. One Indian has died here, but you should not grieve. I shall cherish you more than he did, and try to drive sorrow from your lives. I will distribute his wealth among you, and make the Indian powerful with crowns and thrones. Then he mounted Four's throne. On the one side there was mourning, and on the other side feasting. But this is the way of the passing world, which brings sorrow to those who dwell in it. For two months Secondar sat on the Indian throne, distributing wealth to the army. Then he placed there as a regent an Indian nobleman named Savorg, saying to him, Don't hide your gold away. Distribute and consume whatever comes to you, and put no faith in this passing world, which sometimes favors seconder, sometimes four, and sometimes gives as pain and rage, sometimes joy and feasting. Savorg, too, distributed gold and silver to the Indian warriors. Now, not long after seconder's army had become wealthy in this way, the clatter of drums rang out as dawn broke, and the air became as brilliant as a rooster's eye from the throng of red, yellow, and purple silken banners. Seconder set out for Mecca, and some of his entourage were pleased by this, some alarmed. With drums rolling and trumpets blaring, he came to the house made with such toil by Abraham, the son of Azar. God named the site the House of Holiness, the goal of it, all of God's roads. He named it his own house and called you to worship there. The world's God has no need for food or pleasure or rest or comfort. 
but this has always been his place of worship, since any place at all has existed, a place to remember God. Secondary approach, Kadchisiya, laying claim to the land from Jerem in Pars as he went. Nasir, the son of Kot of Katab, heard of his approach and went out to welcome him with a group of noble horsemen bearing lances. A horseman hurried from Mecca to Seconder, telling him that the man who was coming to greet him had no desire for wealth or power, and was a descendant of Esmal, the son of Abraham. When Nazra ar arrived, Seconder welcomed him and assigned him a splendid place in his entourage. Nazra was overjoyed and recounted to Seconder the secrets of his lineage. The king answered him, My honest and pure-hearted lord, tell me, who is the noblest of your tribe after yourself? Nazra replied, O ruler of the world, Jaza is the greatest man in this place. When Ismail departed his life, the world conqueror, Katab, appeared from the deserts with a host of savage swordsmen, and by the main force took the land of Yemen. Many innocent men were killed at that time, and the fortunes of our tribes declined. But God was not pleased with Katab, and the heavens darkened for him. When he died, Jaza took his place, an unjust and troublesome man. From the shrine here to Yemen is all under his control, and his men fish the Red Sea. He has turned away from justice and gives no thought to the one God. He holds the land here in his fist, and the tribe of Esmal welters in the blood because of him. When Secunder heard these words, he sought out everyone he could find from the family of Jaza and had them killed. The children's souls were parted from their bodies, and not one of his race was left alive. With the help of his warriors, he freed Hejaz, the Yemen, from their unjust rulers, and exalted the tribe of Esmel. Then he went on foot to the shrine, and the people of Esmel were so overjoyed at his presence that wherever he trod, the king's treasure scattered gold coins before him. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends. <laughs>